Good day, citizens. And thank you for listening to this week's podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Robinson Crusoe, a novel by Daniel Defoe, published in 1719. Four editions in the first few months. A runaway bestseller, one of the earliest of all novels, one of the best to this day. And more than that, paradigmatic. In other words, there are millions of people who know the Robinson Crusoe story who've never read it because the story is that deeply embedded in the, in, in the understanding we have of, of the, the history of the West. It really did make a fortune for Defoe. And I think I mentioned in the show that in researching it, the first year it was released, it was four printings. Yes, and he uh, then went on to write a sequel, which wasn't very good. He wrote a bunch of other novels, including a couple that I really like, Mall Flanders, which is the another economic story of a prostitute, a young woman who was kind of from the wrong side of the tracks and sort of wound up being a whore and eventually flourishes and becomes an economic success. That was scandalous, but it, and it's not very um, salacious, but it was scandalous at the time. And then Journey... Journal of a Plague Year, which is his fictionalized account of the great bubonic plague of the 1660s that carried off uh, one in six or seven of, of all the people in London. But it's fairly factual, isn't it? It's factual, but it's fictionalized, and that's one of the things. The novel wasn't, no one really knew yet quite what the novel was going to be. They're inventing it. And so he's using a kind of a porous line between fact and fiction, and you don't know. If you didn't know that these were novels, you might assume that they were government reports. Uh, the And the account by Robinson Crusoe is very realistic in that he has, there are journal entries, there are long periods of his reflecting on his uh, whether he's right with God and, and whether he's a, a sinner or, or going to be saved. Uh, then there are these very factual accounts of, of how he responded to this and that. It's not uh, fiction in the in the full, it's not like a Jane Austen novel. It's still, the, the novel is still trying to figure out exactly how it's going to operate. And he's one of the first and one of the best. And his prose style is just, uh, it's stunningly clear and simple. Uh, you, you can find this book for little or nothing uh, online. Um, if free, you, if I you got have a free issue on uh, my ebook. Um, the, if you're interested to go a little farther, we didn't mention this in the show, but, but you, yeah. uh, we first talked on the Jefferson Hour back in 2006. We did a couple of shows on on uh, Robinson Crusoe before it was this, you, selected as a book. We were children then. Yes, I don't of even remember this. Yeah. Um, well, it's a it's one of my favorite books. In addition to being a Jefferson novel, I just love it. I think, that, but then I was so troubled this time because you know, you, you, and I didn't realize this until last night. But you know, he does all this agonizing about the state of his soul and is he a sinner and is he going to hell and is God punishing him and if so, for what. At no point does he ever say, because I'm a slave trader, and he was a slave trader. So he's he's part of the slave trade. He's he's, he's making money from the buying and selling of, of black Africans uh, to the new world. And eventually he has this shipwrecked, and he never thinks, well, maybe God shipwrecked me because yeah, I'm involved no, in the slave no, trade. None of that at all. It's yeah. all like, no, well, because I didn't listen well, to my business. father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, that's, that's a little upsetting to think that for, it, it's upsetting in two different ways. That Defoe never raised this question. So there's a lot of self-reflection in the book. Who am I? What have I done? Who have I harmed? You know, where'd I, where'd I, where'd I get on the wrong path? At no point in this book does Defoe or any character say, uh, buying and selling human beings might be it. So that, that differentiates him from Jefferson, who well, said that God was just and his justice cannot sleep forever. True, but it, it also reinforces the point that it was just a matter of fact. That's the way the world worked. That was the way the world worked, and yeah. people simply took it for granted, however awful yeah. that might seem. But I had never noticed it before, and that troubled me that I had been yeah. blind to that until now because we're so – now we're so attuned to the questions of race and slavery. There are a couple of other books. Uh, one that, that I read that I really liked, uh, uh, one by Tim Severin uh, called Seeking Robinson Crusoe. I think it came out in 2002. Seeking Robinson Crusoe? Yeah. I have not read that one, but I did read Selkirk's Island, The True and Strange Adventures of the Real Robinson Crusoe. Who was only marooned for five years and partly at his own— 52 months. And, and he asked for uh, Well, it. kind of, yeah. He, was, he got into a dispute and he asked to be landed at yeah. this place where it wasn't deserted, so he knew that at some point someone was going to come. Anyway, that one's by Diana Suhami, and I really enjoyed what one, that What's book. that one called? Selkirk's Island, The True and Strange Adventures of the Real Robinson Crusoe. 
Yeah, uh, so this... Uh, if you if anybody wants to take this a little farther, I, those are two... Well, I want to read um, um, Seeking Robinson Crusoe because I'm guessing that... It's what, that's a Tony Horowitz kind of thing where you go to the island and you look around. Uh, no, Selkirk's you, Island, Diana. Right. She, yeah, they she's, visit these she, places. She, and, she goes there and finds the spots that he used to that sit Selkirk and watch. Did. Yeah, that Selkirk would watch for ships and and there are still wild goats there and all that. So. He comes back to Scotland, Selkirk does, uh-huh. uh, after these five years. Um, his life didn't. He, his life didn't get back on track, but Robinson's did. Robinson comes back after 28 years to England, and it's as if he, he never left. It's as if he went on a brief summer vacation and right. came back. You know, if you get into this, and not to get into this now, but we should get to the show. But uh, uh, there are those who don't think that Selkirk was Defoe's only model. That's, a, that is correct. A number of other. Um, this was kind of like. Uh, People wanted to hear these stories. Because these stories existed. I mean, this is the great age of discovery when the new right. world has we been discovered. People didn't know what was out there. We don't know the longitude yet, right, so yeah. ships are constantly breaking up on reefs and rocks and, right. and, are, and storms. And there are lots of deaths and, and people disappear. And there wasn't – one of the things that I found interesting about this novel is when he finally gets back, he discovers he's rich because of this plantation that's been accruing – uh, wealth in in Brazil, he has no. There's no way to bank the money. There's no security. There's no. There's no Bank of England. There's, there's he he has to be careful about these funds. If he's not watching them all the time, he can't protect them because the modern economic infrastructure that we simply take for granted. And he didn't is a exist materialistic yet. guy. Well, and so. Defoe was. Defoe was in debt. He went bankrupt. He had. He was actually pilloried at one point for writing a seditious. Um, uh, tract. He has a long, and he's not so different in some ways from Thomas Paine. Um, and he, but so he was kind of a rascal in some ways, but prolific. He wrote more than two hundred books. If you've if you've read Robinson Crusoe and you're looking for your second one, the one to read is Maul Flanders. If you're looking for your third one, it's Journal of a Plague Year. But all of his writing is superb, and he's one of the masters of English prose. And the book is something that Jefferson. Uh, admired and I admire even more and I'm glad I'm glad we read it before we go to the show let me just say the winter encampments the winter retreats are full we've actually been turning people away I'm sorry to say but there'll be more next year um, so the space program is full uh, France the, the Dickens program is full France is closed and uh, but but Cuba 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 so I'm going to Cuba with 16 people in February it's Theodore Roosevelt's Cuba. But you'll miss the snow, Clay. Yeah. Uh, it's Cuba before we ruin it. It's Cuba of the Bay of Pigs and, the, and Guantanamo in the Cold War. It's Cuba of Ernest Hemingway. And so all those, and, and I know something about Cuba, but it's all from books I've never been. But Wayne Fairchild of the Lewis and Clark Tours has been many, many times, and he is now an expert in this. And he's and my good to, friend Mike has been and just... Can't get People enough, love it. Wants to go it's back. It's like going into time. 1961, yeah. oh. but without you know, in a kind of wonderful way. Yeah, that's and what so, he says too. And people should come. And I know a lot of people think, oh, isn't the Trump administration trying to shut that? They've shut down cruise ships, but it is still possible, quite legally, without any troubles, either at at any at any. Well, this is place. a cultural tour, right? And, and these are still. Eminently they're, they're, legal and, and, and fine, just, yeah. and, and up you, to, you can only take sixteen, and we're doing it. People can contact and get more details right. they, if they have any But go to jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours. Right. But this is one not to be missed. I do think the chances are we may wind up closing down Cuba in the next few years. I hope not. Um, I do think that even worse that once Costco and the American capitalist system get their toes into Cuba, they'll damage it. It's part of what's wonderful about it is that it's sort of locked. It's like a in time, time capsule, right? And yeah. it's what the Caribbean was. Yeah, I can't wait to go. So if you're interested, this is a, a really good trip to to come on, and you okay. mustn't worry about the legal aspects. It's you you got to quit, time. or I'm not going to have any time to do my pitch, which I have to make really close and short. Well, you're now. going into your voice now. Well, just just to say that we really do appreciate each and every one of you who has chosen to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour in whatever way you can, whatever way you have. If you would like to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour, please go to jeffersonhour.com. 
click on donate. You might want to become a monthly subscriber through the 1776 Club. Um, there's a bunch of benefits you can find out about that, as in more content. Those of you who have just made immediate donations, thank you very, very, very much. We take nothing, uh, neither Claire or I do. We do this because we want to. We kind of uh, have talked ourselves into feeling like we were making a contribution of sorts. So, and if um, you believe that, it's true. Send money. Yeah, do. And uh, uh, with that, let's let's go to this week's show and, and Cuba, thank Cuba, you. Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Thank you so much for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. And this week on the Thomas Jefferson Hour, we rejoin the Jefferson Hour Book Club. Seated across from me is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And Clay, you picked Robinson Crusoe, a book we've talked about a number of times, and perhaps you can share with us what made you pick that book. Well, this novel was published in 1719, so just a generation before the birth of our man Jefferson. It was a book that Jefferson read and admired. Uh, you can see why. Uh, it's about what might be called economic man. So Robinson Crusoe winds up on this uh, deserted island. He gets to harvest some of the uh, things that were on the ship that wrecked. Um, he then has to build a life. And uh, in the course of the, of the novel, he builds an extraordinary life. He uh, he secures his shelter. Uh, he starts a farm. Uh, then he starts a ranch. He, he, he learns how to be a carpenter. He learns how to be a, a pot thrower, a ceramicist. Uh, he, he sort of masters all of the basic trades in the course of the novel in order to survive. And so for it, it's really, a, in a certain sense, a, a novel, of course, but it's a novel in the history of ideas about how civilization is created from nothing to a fairly high level of security and comfort. But and, you and Crusoe pick, does this in and of himself. You pick this out of Jefferson's library, and it's it's very unique because it is a novel. And I'm not sure that uh, Jefferson Hour listeners understand that. Maybe you can give us some perspective on that. Well, he wasn't a great friend to novels, I think is your point. Uh, he read nonfiction mostly. Well, there was kind mostly. of a new form, The novel's too. just being born. And Daniel yeah. Defoe, the author, who, by the way, who wrote this novel at the age of 60. See, he had many other lives. He's not some young guy. So at the age of 60, he writes The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. It becomes a runaway um, Enlightenment bestseller went through many editions. Fourth printing in its first year, and he he became economically secure because of it. His printer certainly did. There were knockoffs, and there has been a Robinson Crusoe industry ever since, mm -hmm. including up and, and recently to say the Martian, you know the and, and the Tom Hanks movie was uh, Castaway. Yeah, yeah, I mean these recent adaptations of the person who's alone on a place and has to use such tools as he has to make things work out. Jefferson was like all of us. He loves this idea of a self-reliant individual who can invent and, and provide for himself. The novel is just being born at this time. It's a new form. It has some ancient roots, but it's really a new form. And Defoe, what, what makes Defoe so interesting, he's in some uh, books called The First Novelist, which isn't quite true, but what makes him so interesting, David, is that he's writing in a in a style that you're not really sure whether it's fiction or nonfiction. It's kind of a crossover style. It's kind of reporting in a certain way, but it's reporting with fictional embellishments. He wrote later something called The Journal of the Plague Year about the great bubonic plague in London in the 1660s, and it, it reads like a, a sociological or government treatise on the plague. He's very interesting, and his prose style is also extraordinary. He's not writing in broad uh, Ciceronian sentences with subordinate clauses and Latin addiction. It's very basic, straightforward, noun, verb, noun, unpretentious in the most uh, important sense of that term. Uh, he creates a clarity of expression that really sets the tone for the novel and continues to be the basic form of the novel even now, although the 20th century was pretty hard on basic sentences. A couple of things that really stuck out to me, and the, the self-reliance, His um, he had a, a materialistic streak to him. He's very materialistic, that, yeah. that keeps coming up through, you know, from the beginning where he's sailing and doing slave trade to, to make money, and that's, that's pretty grim. Um, but he's very materialistic, and he, he becomes... 
overwhelmed with um, God. How, you know, what's God doing to me? Why have I? Why is God doing this to me? And both of those things, they kind of run through the whole book. It's a it? spiritual classic in addition to being all the things that we've said about it so far. He was a Quaker by training, and, and, and the Protestant tradition in this era was of self-catechism, that you examine your life and that you, you, you create a journal maybe to talk about where you are with respect to salvation and and God, where you fit in the scheme of, 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 of God's purposes. And so his father, the, the character's father, uh, urges him not to go to sea, mm-hmm. just have a quiet lower middle class life or oh, upper yeah, working you, class. What, how did he put when you reach the middle? Uh, of, the, of the lower echelon. This is the safe That's where place, you want right, to be. It's yeah. safe. It's secure. You'll have a good life. Right. Robinson Crusoe has some kind of a wandering, roving spirit. He also is a little bit reckless. He goes off. He gets a couple of warning trips where he should have learned his lesson. Where well, he, he kind of makes a deal with God and says, "If you save me from this this I'm terrible done. storm, I'll stay on land." But but he doesn't it, do it doesn't stick. So then he finally and, and and you said it. We have to realize that this novel is about a man who was involved in the slave trade. He he shipwrecks when he's been on a. He's been he's been recruited to go to Africa and to buy or kidnap black Africans to bring them to Brazil in the slave trade. Right, and it, it, there's no question in the book about it's just like a matter of fact. It's um, just this guy trades oats and barley. This guy trades human beings. And when he has these religious um, agonies, which which happen with great that's a good way of putting frequency it. agonies. His concern is not oh God's punishing me for being a slave trader. <laughs> God's punishing him for going to sea against his father's wishes, but Uh there's no moral, neither Defoe nor any character in the novel ever says, slavery, really? You think that's okay? That's not an issue. That's Uh just a given. That tells us a lot, not about Jefferson, but about the age that created Jefferson, because slavery was just seen as a fact of life. But speaking of Jefferson, I want, if you would, uh, you to share... Your opinion of what it was that fascinated Jefferson so much about this book? I'm sure the mastery. Like the, you know, it's like Jefferson. I made a list as I was reading the other day. Uh, first, he uh, he secures his, his his quarters and digs out a cave, and then he he finds these the famous seed moment that I love so much, where yeah, he's dumping yeah. out this little bag and some barley, twenty or so barley seeds come out. He doesn't and he's sure God had something to do with that and, too. And, and God, yeah. you know, but he, they grow, and then suddenly he's okay. How much do I need to grow per annum? And what's my bushel? I don't want a surplus because there's nowhere to trade it. So he starts a farm with both rice and barley, and then he starts a ranch. He has goat herds that he has, and then he has he divides his ranches over the island. He has not only one boat but a second boat and he uses the second boat for like pleasure excursions and then he has he becomes a a carpenter uh, a ceramicist and just when he finally sees the fatal footprint in the sand he's about to learn how to make beer but he says at some point yeah there's nothing i couldn't master because i got all the time in the world here. right so that 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 brings jefferson's gonna love that okay so you you mentioned you know uh, the martian the most recent right take on this and you know, the, the novel we, turned film. We, yeah, we watch that or we read that, and you know he discovers that he can grow some potatoes, and he does it. And isn't it's there the a part in, in all of us that goes, "Yeah, that's what I do. I could do that." Yeah, we think we could. Yeah, but, but you know that's part of the enjoyment of reading the book. So help me, did Jefferson do that, or was he going like, "This is the enlightened state of man," uh, and an example of? It. Well, it's both. So so he, Robinson Crusoe washes up. Yeah. And within a few years, he's like got a colonial estate. He's got properties all over. It's like a small industrial village that he's built. And there's he keeps doing more and more and more. It's not like I eke out survival and that's going to be enough if I've got food for tomorrow. He's got storage facilities. Well, and he, and he, the shipwrecks that he, he goes and harvests from times, every shipwreck. Yeah, and, and, Gets so all that, the gunpowder so that he's, he can. He, he, this is this is the history of civilization. We started off as these people who could you know somehow learned to light fire. So the, Jefferson and then maybe did he think sees this, this was this was enlightenment proof. Oh, absolutely. This okay. was this was the this was the evolution of society seen in a single man. Uh-huh. But look where it goes. Okay, that's good. I like look, that. Look yeah. where it goes, David. So that the minute he meets Friday, this indigenous person, he enslaves him, makes him his servant. He calls himself the king, yeah, but, but the it, master. It, it's not like that in the book because Friday is on his knees kissing uh, Robinson Crusoe's feet for saving him from becoming food for some cannibals. Well, what's the so, name he teaches 
Friday to call him master. Yeah. Not Robinson, not boss, not friend. Yeah. Master. And I'm not I'm not trying to take that too far. I'm merely saying at no point did Robinson Crusoe think, oh, here's this indigenous person, we'll become best friends, we'll be equal, we'll share the island. Well, when he's in Brazil, he had sold one of his own personal slaves and regrets it later because he could have used a slave to right. help him with it. <laughs> so there's that. But, yeah. so, but, but, but the point that I'm making is that Jefferson is, 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 is watching this and he's seeing that what Defoe is doing is basically talking about how we move from a primitive state through greater and greater levels of of sophistication and civilization to surplus property and to trade. And if at the end, when you know when he's saved, everyone knows that he gets back to England, he goes back and he creates a, an economic colony on the island and he puts mm-hmm. pioneers there and brings them women so that they can marry off and so on because he wants to create a productive plantation colony. He's doing what colonial societies well, I, inevitably do. You know, it's a great storyline. I wonder, was there anything prior to Robinson Crusoe that Defoe used as a as a blueprint. He had written there were accounts. So, so like Selkirk, Selkirk and, had been yeah. marooned on the other side of of uh, yeah, this South is America. Alexander Selkirk, Selkirk who Scottish had been five years on an island. He was yeah. rescued. It was not a re- remote island in quite the same sense. He had wanted to be dropped there and because he, had he was been in marooned. A dispute. Yeah, but but here's what and I'm going to talk about this in in the Jefferson Watch essay. But here's the part that fails. After all this time. Crusoe comes back to England, and it's as if he'd been in Vegas or something. I mean, there's no sense of PTSD. He's not weird. Uh, he, he has no reentry issues. He just goes right back to his life. We know that that's not going to happen. When Selkirk was caught, he had learned to sprint and run down right. goats, yeah. and they wouldn't rescue him until he showed them that he could do it. Like, you got to demonstrate that. Right. So he's off chasing down a goat. He had significant reentry issues. We're going to do something a little different uh, in our uh, book club episode this week. Uh, For those of you that listen to the show regularly, and if you don't, go back to last week's show. We just had uh, the most wonderful conversation with David Nicandri. And at the end of that conversation, we asked him if we could talk to him a bit more about Robinson Crusoe. So... And about this encounter with the other, with a capital O. Yeah. So in the next segment, we're we're going to uh, we're going to rejoin our conversation with David Nicandri and get his take on Robinson Crusoe. Yes, David, we had Nicandri on to talk about his journey to the Arctic Circle with his son Dominic, and I just thought, well, you know, he's going to have something really interesting to say about Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> and because, he did. And he, he did. did. He yeah. did. Yeah. So we'll we'll we'll. we'll We'll bring a little of that conversation into segment two of the Jefferson Hour. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. David Nicandri bonus. I had the chance to ask him what he thinks of the encounter with the alien, with the other, in Robinson Crusoe and in the history of exploration. Welcome, David Nicandri, who is the former executive director of the Washington State Historical Society, one of my dear friends, the author of River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia, and a forthcoming book on Captain James Cook. We're talking about uh, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, one of my favorite books, and a book Jefferson came back to. And I want to ask you this really serious, serious question. Uh, It's about contact with the other. So at a certain point in the book, Robinson Crusoe has been living alone for 15 years. He's gotten into this kind of um, complacency. He crosses to the other side of the island, uh, which he does periodically, and uh, he's shocked uh, when he looks down and he sees a, a footprint in on the beach, a footprint in the sand. This is one of the paradigmatic moments of Western novels. It's one of the great moments in the history of literature, the, um, the footprint in the sand. And so he then goes back, Dave, and, and gets all uh, freaked out and, and builds a fort and starts arming himself to the teeth. And he begins to fret about what this represents. And I just want to read you a piece from an essay that I wrote and see what you think, because it really made me think. So this is it. Robinson Crusoe has been alone on the deserted island for 15 years. During that time, he has longed for a companion 10,000 times, anyone to talk to, anyone to be a fellow human in community with. But when he finds a footprint in the sand, He freaks out and spends two full years building fortifications 
and a semi-automatic musket firing system. The novelist Daniel Defoe says he is so heavily armed that when he ventures out of the fortification, he gets easily exhausted by the rifles, pistols, powder, bullets, and sword he lugs around with him for protection. Crusoe assumes that the other, with a capital O, individual, tribe, nation, is likely to try to exploit him, to steal his grain or his goat herd, take away whatever they find in his dwellings, enslave him, torture him, rape him, kill him, maybe even eat him. He has to think about these possibilities. So this is a novel. But when, think about that for a minute, uh, Dave Nicandri. So Lewis and Clark and Mackenzie and Captain Cook and all of these people are out there, and they're meeting what we would call third-world indigenous people. When that happens, for any of them, they can't know what the Lakota are going to do, what the Nez Perce are going to do, what the Hawaiians are going to do. And the Hawaiians can't know what these bearded, heavily armed people who came suddenly out of the sea or, or, or over the ridge are going to do. There's this kind of moment of uncertainty, and it is inevitably a dangerous moment. It's inevitably something that could spin out of control. We know what happens in the Lewis Clark story, don't we? That it all comes out pretty well. But there are a few moments where this tension sort of rises. But but talk a little bit about this. For someone like Captain Cook or Meriwether Lewis, we take it for granted because they come home safely. Cook did not. Cook was killed in the Sandwich Islands on the third voyage. What what? How can we, as as readers and students today use our imaginations to put ourselves into that moment of uncertainty and terror. Well, it's the contingent aspect of that dynamic play that you that you typified with that passage that jumps out at me. And I'll just take Captain Cook's experiences because they're just the most topical in my mind, uh, uh, work, having work, working on that most recently. And that is, uh, um, uh, just to give a few examples, so the first time Cook arrives in Tahiti, uh, very, very uh, warm welcome. But when he gets to New Zealand, he's met very suspiciously. Until he's killed in Hawaii on the third voyage, it's the most tumultuous and violent uh, encounter of any on his voyage. Um, uh, when he, but to jump ahead to Hawaii on the third uh, third voyage, when he first arrives, it's just a it's just a joyous occasion. Uh, Cook writes about uh, thousands of people swarming around the ship, swimming around his two ships like dolphins, being feeded and feasted and fed. But all of that, of course, turns because the liturgical calendar changes on Cook, so to speak. And when he comes back to the very same harbor uh, a month later, uh, it's a very, much different cultural dynamic, and within that dynamic, uh, Cook is dispatched by the same, very same people that had joyously greeted him the month before. So with those few episodes as an example, one explorer, one ocean, three different places, and three entirely different reactions. So I guess the takeaway from that for an explorer in those situations, there was no way to predict how things would go. It could go well, it could go terribly somewhere in between, but you had to allow for the worst of them. But of course, they were uniformly grateful and joyous when things went well, because that meant they would have an easier time to manage. Their crew wouldn't suffer. They wouldn't inflict any harm on the indigenous people trying to protect themselves. That was the desired outcome always, but it could not always be counted upon. And you know that, that moment out at at Fort Clatsop in Astoria when Lewis in the spring of, of 1806 writes this kind of what appears to be kind of a paranoid journal entry saying, I had to warn the men that they shouldn't get complacent because the minute you let your guard down, you don't know what's going to happen. And there are innumerable examples in the history of North America when uh, p people have been wiped out by savages or, or by hostility because they trusted and they and they and you have to stay on your guard every single minute. And even though that may, might seem um, uh, too much, um, this is the only way to secure uh, the re the safe return of yourself and 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 your documents to the civilized world. When you read 
that at, you know just out of the blue you think oh come on um, that's just crazy that's paranoia but when you when you actually start to think about Cook in New Zealand or the two um, receptions of Cook a month apart in in Hawaii or etc all these things you realize what how how volatile and fraught these moments were well, yes and I'm reminded of one of the great Jim Rhonda's most trenchant sayings about exploration history and Lewis and Clark in particular. But Jim wrote so beautifully about how, at least in, ca- in the case of the Lewis and Clark story, with the passage of time, all the rough spots get rounded over, all the rough edges get rounded over. And then in retrospect, everything looks like, well, it had to turn out that way. All but one of Lewis and Clark's men had to come back. And, I, and I'm just reminded of that because in, in, in Cook's case, although in fact, he was killed on the third voyage. One of the points I try to make in my uh, forthcoming book, Rediscovering uh, Captain Cook, is that Cook could have met a fate similar to the one he did at Kealakekua Bay in February 1779, by my count, at least half a dozen other times. Uh, but uh, an arrow or, or a spear would go over his shoulder, or something would happen to, uh, that almost providentially would save the day. But Cook had gotten in moments like the one in which he met his ultimate fate several times. It's just that in the earlier instances, either through force of arms, a good break here or there, he was able to survive it. So Cook could have easily been killed on the first voyage. Um, uh, but he but he survived first two and was killed on the third. So again, it's the it's the notion of how the story gets the rough edges of the story get rounded off, and how the retrospective glance is overly deterministic. Um, but there uh, and that there's a lot more contingency to the story than the modern reader nor, or the historians writing for the modern reader tend to posit in their narratives. David, you used a phrase when you were talking about these these incidents uh, that Captain Cook might have been killed, and you said he was providentially saved. And, you know, bringing it back to the book we've been discussing this week, Robinson Crusoe, that's sort of a theme for Crusoe throughout the book. Uh, you know, he wrestles with his faith and whether or not um, God is punishing him or or saving him. Is there any evidence of that, say, in, in Cook's journals? Uh, where did God stand in all of this, or did he not have a stand at all? Well, I use the term providential because that is a term of art that Captain Cook did not use a lot, but it shows up occasionally in his journals. Cook was a man of the Enlightenment. He was he was a Quaker denominationally, although he had he, he deported himself with personal characteristics that one would deem classically Christian, I suppose. But he but he was not an he was not overt in religiosity. Did not did not uh, did not force that upon the, the, his crews during the three voyages. But and Clay is far more co- better cope to delve into this than I. So I'll just hope to tee him up. The figures of the Enlightenment going back to Newton, Cook would be an emblematic figure for the late environment. They believed in God. Uh, they believed that that God was the mainspring of the universe, that the, that the natural order was one that God ordained. But they did not believe that God overtly intervened in human affairs. And they made a, they usually made a very distinct separation between the notion of God versus the Trinitarian notion with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So I, I hope I've given some justice to that theme. Um, so Cook certainly believed in God, thought that he had been saved providentially on, on several occasions. The two that come to my mind is when Endeavor on the first voyage, gets hung up on the Great Barrier Reef. There seems to be no hope of surviving, but they uh, they unload the vessel of the cannon and the ballast, wait for the high tide to come in, and in fact they float off and beach the ship and, and, uh, and all is saved. Then on the third voyage, he's sailing in the fog off the Aleutian Islands. In the middle of the night, they hear the crashing of waves, and so the, uh, the officer on deck calls the ships to a halt, 
and they find themselves right between two rocks out in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, not that far from shore, but far enough off, um, 10, 20 miles maybe, that, um, as Cook put it, um, one wouldn't have dared sailed through those rocks in broad daylight, but here's where they ended up providentially because the, the uh, night watchman had heard the crashing of the waves on those rocks and called the ships short. So that is how the notion of providence worked in the late Enlightenment. But providential is a pretty interesting um, word because it can mean several things, can't it? I mean, it can mean, boy, we were lucky to get off that, and you almost have to think that there was providence looking out after us because we dodged that bullet. Uh, That would be sort of providential light but robinson crusoe bet comes up for him on every little thing of course he was there alone for decades he, so. and, and robinson crusoe's at the other end of the spectrum where yep. no the god himself the god of the universe is watching out for me and he's been punishing me but he also has stepped in to preserve me and that that has to be seen as god's overt act i take it that that cook was it's not clear where he is on this spectrum but i think he's closer to the um, things worked out pretty well end of the spectrum than that God, the God of the universe, is watching my ship hour by hour. That describes it perfectly. I just want to thank you for this, but but here's what the insight that you brought to this. I'm reading Robinson Crusoe. I've read it umpteen times. Um, so you see something new every time. Here's this moment where he he suddenly thinks, "Oh my goodness, I'm not alone." And the person, and he has to immediately go from that footprint to that person might be hostile. Um, that person is probably hostile. That person is probably going to damage me if he can. I need now to be especially vigilant. And when I saw that, I just looked up from the page, Dave, and I thought, this is a thing that every Lewis and Clark scholar or every Mackenzie student or every Captain Cook student needs to remember that we know, and you said it, that Rhonda tells us, we know how the narrative comes out. The edges have been smoothed off. We know that it all comes out okay. Uh, you know, we count on the, on, on the narrative certainty that we bring to the project. We can never read these things as if for the first time because we already know that Cook dies on the third voyage. And we already know that Lewis and Clark get back successfully in the fall of 1806. And so Rhonda is telling us, and you, and you are reinforcing that, that we need to re- mysterious eyes, re 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 complicate and, and 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 restore the the contingency and the dangerousness and the and the uncertainty of these stories to really understand them. For example, Clay, you and I were recently and you brought this to my attention. Uh Lewis and Clark, the, the expedition somewhere out in western North Dakota, eastern Montana, and uh they and the captains have their tent under a tree and then there's a there's a prairie fire, and I'm not sure either. I'm not sure it's the captains who record this. It might be one of the enlisted men, but um, but I but I've read those journals before, not as often as the Columbia River segment, again for obvious reasons. But I've read through that volume before, and until you called my attention to it, and 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 the fire just rages on. I mean, who knows for how many miles that fire went, but. Uh, and 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 burning embers are falling on the tent. And could have been killed right there before they had barely jumped off from Fort Mandan. So, how different that story would have turned out if that um, uh, tree. Uh, uh, You're absolutely right, and we don't notice these things because uh, we're reading fast, and because we know the story, and we impose a certain linear quality to it, and we know that providence holds up. Well, and there's another aspect to a clay, and, and this is something I've really gotten into. And that is the ability of certain early narrators or certain effective narrators to overlay an interpretive imprint on the story. And it becomes so compelling. It's so authoritatively written that it informs every subsequent reader of the journal's outlook on the story because they've been informed as to what to look for. And how what we think is the story is actually an encrustation of subsidiary and subsequent and retrospective interpretations. And that more than the underlying original document of the explorer is what we respond to. 
when we read the original journals than the original journals themselves. Does that make any sense? Perfect sense. So to close this discussion, and thank you for joining us in this uh, special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour about Daniel Defoe's novel, um, Robinson Crusoe, you know, this in the in the long term history of the Lewis and Clark story, people will say how much of what the 21st century understood was um, was Stephen Ambrose's Lewis and Clark, and how much was Lewis and Clark's Good. Lewis and Clark. But a, a book of that importance is going to have set the narrative tide for a very 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 long time, even by those who see through some of the um, the issues in a, a book of that um, magnitude, a, a bestseller that is still very widely read in the Lewis and Clark world. Dave McAndrew, thank you for joining us. Um, Before you go, I think it's important we play that scene of finding the footprint to the end because in the end, Robinson Crusoe gets his gumption back and goes back to the beach so he can measure whose foot is bigger. He does go back to make sure that the foot is not his own because he thought, well, maybe I was just delirious and walking on the beach. But then when um, it, it comes out pretty badly, Mr. Nicandri, because when he finally meets Friday, whose footprint it wasn't, but this indigenous fellow Friday, he calls him, because he discovered him on a Friday, um, he immediately enslaves Friday as his personal valet and servant. At no point in Robinson Crusoe uh, does Crusoe think, oh, here's another human being. Let's meet as equals. Uh, his immediate uh, assumption is, I'm civilized. He's not. I'll enslave him. He'll be my servant. He might even be grateful. Uh, and that's the way that... Thanks so much for joining us, Mr. Nicandri. I, I, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm still kind of uh, going through last week's wonderful conversation about your trip to the Arctic Ocean. Well, thank you, David. It's always a... It's always a pleasure to spend some quality time with fellow citizens of the Republic (laughs) of Letters. (laughs) We need to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Let me jump in here. I'm Clay Jenkinson, just to invite you to come with me to Cuba, our cultural tour to historical Cuba, February 8th through 17th year 2020. All the visas and other logistics are in place. Wayne Fairchild has been there many times. It is amazing. Bay of Pigs and the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Ernest Hemingway, who spent some of the best years of his life uh, fishing off of Cuba. And Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, a man of destiny who climbed San Juan Hill on July 1st, 1898, what he called my crowded hour. And above all, I want to see Cuba before things really begin to change as it opens up to American corporate capitalism. So 8th through 17th February, Cuba, go to the Jefferson Hour site, jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours for all the details. Welcome back to this book club edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm out of character this week. We have a Jefferson book club. You can follow it along at jeffersonhour.com. This week's selection is Daniel Defoe's novel, Robinson Crusoe. David, Robinson Crusoe is one of those paradigmatic novels where you know it even if you've never read it. You know about someone who winds up on this island and he builds a new life for himself and eventually he finds a famous footprint in the sand and and then the rest unfolds. Yeah, it's great fun. It, it, you, I, it, but before we go any farther, we have to thank um, David McCandry for the last segment for weighing in all, all this. It was just, he's uh, such a terrific guy and it's so much fun to... Listen to the way he uses words. It's so interesting yeah. to me that that Crusoe is alone and he's just desperately lonely. It, and then but, finally a stranger comes and he's terrified. Very materialistic, very influenced by what he worries God's opinion is of him and how he should act. And and I do go back to that that scene to the end is after being so frightened and so he finally sneaks his way back to the beach to to measure and see. I, I mean I took it to see if his foot was bigger. Um, I, well, he certainly wanted to see if his foot was the same because he too. was hoping that it was his foot because yeah. he wanted to be alone. And so you want to be with others, but they have to share your value system. Uh-huh. These He thinks they're, they're cannibals, and there's evidence that these people were, at least in the novel. It gets a little grim with all of that back and forth. And he's watching yeah. this, and he thinks, well, th- these are not necessarily people I want to share my island with. And so then he becomes paranoid and, and arms himself to the teeth, and there's a famous – moment of that that I copied out where he says, the minute I saw that footprint, I stopped making improvements in my domestic life. Mm -hmm. I stopped being a carpenter. 
I, that whole thing about brewing beer, I gave up. He said, I, I got into kind of a siege mentality now, and all I could think about was security questions. So what you take away from that, I mean, this is clearly Defoe's opinion, uh, and Jefferson would agree with this, that the minute you go down the Hamiltonian path of war and war preparation, that means you're not and materialism. doing the arts. You, you, I wish he would have talked to somebody about this book. Or Jefferson, yeah. written a paper on it that, that we could research because it'd be so interesting to, to hear what Jefferson's take on it was, what he really, you know, what he admired about it. Was. We know three we know three novels with Jefferson, and, and they're very different. And the novel's just being born. It's still an experimental form. Just, Jefferson has probably read 50 or 60, but yeah. Robinson Crusoe, uh, we know that he um, read and appreciated Tristram Shandy right. by Lawrence Stern, which is a wacky, early, postmodern, yeah, experimental yeah, hard novel, read. hard to read, yeah. quirky, um, eccentric, but, but he and Martha loved it and read it to each oh, other. Oh, and then and I, I, my new Martha, my super fan, actually went to UVA to look at the passage where he writes out part of a p- famous passage from Tristram Shandy, and so does she. Time wastes too fast, and this is one of the like the last love exchange right. between yeah. Jefferson and his wife. Uh, he also became part of the cult of sensitivity that uh, that Lawrence Stern represented. Uh, he had other books about uh, travel. And uh, and about being exquisitely sensitive to other people's feelings. What's the third? I, I, oh, I'm having trouble. Here. Uh, the third is Don Quixote. Oh, of course. So Jefferson claimed this is one of the few things he ever read twice. But the, but again, you have a, a very different book. This is a long um, account of a of a quixotic. We use that term from Don Quixote, a, a an idealistic uh, man who is highly ineffectual, but uh, but he dreams of being a knight errant in the old medieval or early Renaissance but it, tradition. I didn't know that that was the only book that he read twice that, that, we, that we know of. Um, and I mean, I'm sure that's not true. Novels, or I mean, because probably you know, he read you know, nonfiction in nonfiction many yeah, times. But yeah. but to think that okay, so Tristram Shandy is a very odd choice, but it was very fashionable. It would be like one of the most fashionable avant-garde things of Jefferson's lifetime, and he loved this idea that the good man is just exquisitely generous and sympathetic and understanding and that he he can sense your needs and he he would never ruffle your feathers and he, he paves the way in front of you. If you're a perfect stranger, he has no agenda. It's agape love. It's just love of, of being a good human being. And Jefferson thinks that's it. That's what we need to be. So there's that. Uh, then there is Don Quixote, which is one of the world's most extraordinary books. I read it all the time. It's just every new translation I read. Um, it's a book about this kind of knight errant who happens to be born way after there's any world of um, of the traveling knight writing mm-hmm. wrongs and, and, and tilting a at A man out of his own time. But this lovely, maybe sar- part, partly senile um, man who travels around thinking that he's living in this heroic world which which no longer exists and his partner is like James Madison his partner is this very realistic guy who keeps saying eh, it doesn't really look like a dragon it looks like a windmill you sure you want to attack it <laughs> and so that's a it's like a magnificent paradigm of the realist and the idealist which in some sense helps to explain Madison and Jefferson and then the third is this novel Robinson Crusoe and you can see the appeal to someone like Jefferson that it's fascinating. You know, you you don't really think of it as a novel at all. You think of it like, oh, how's he going to solve the problem? He he want he's wanting to build ceramics, and so he thinks, well, they're breaking, they're not holding together. How do I change the chemistry? Do I change the amount of heat? Do I build something yeah, around? He's, it? And he's just marvelous at that. He just that's what but the book is about: is solving we, economic problems. It's time is slipping by, and we're going to uh, need to go to your essay soon, sir. But. There's one thing that we have not touched on, and I want to end the conversation there, if we might. Uh, Russ Eagle and the Grand Experiment. The P, because we didn't get a chance to really talk about this, so that, that passage changed my life. So he he's digging through stuff. Well, he's emptying out a bag finds of a little bag, or barley or something. No, he just thinks there's a bag. It's got some dust or something in it. All emptied out so I can use it for something else. Uh-huh. And he shakes this stuff out, and he doesn't even realize what he's shaking out. It's It's seeds. And he walks away, doesn't notice it, and then a few weeks later they sprout. And he thinks, oh, this is he providence. It got, yeah. But civilization is when we cease being hunter-gatherers and we begin to plant. 
so I gave Russ a P uh-huh. a, a few years ago at, at, on one of my cultural tours, and I said, Russ, you have to make this P proliferate until you are buried in P's. And he has. And the same thing happened. So like Robinson Crusoe the first year gets an okay crop, not a great crop. He realizes he planted in the wrong place, but he gets enough. So he can save the seed. After a few experiments, he finally masters it. And then he has to start to limit himself because he says, you don't want a lot of surplus grain sitting around if you can't ship it anywhere. And so Russ has had, it's rough because where he lives in um, in North Carolina, it's not ideal P country, let's put it that way. But he now has, I think I asked him recently, he has about a quart of peas, which is plenty because if he if he then planted all of them, he'd have a gallon of peas. And then if he planted, planted all of them, he'd have 30 gallons. And suddenly you're Robinson Crusoe. We, but probably, this, we this, probably need to schedule a, a conversation with him. This famous passage changed my life because I thought that's exactly it's the it's the miracle of the mustard seed in another way that you put the seed in the ground and suddenly a dozen spring up that's for Jefferson and the physiocrats that's how wealth gets started it is time for your essay sir uh, but but before we go you would you would give this a thumbs up I'm assuming everybody should read Robinson Crusoe I, I'm sure you can get it you know, it's free, free online. You can free get it. just a dollar. Or no, it's free. Like I, I got a free edition online. Yeah. I have about yeah. twenty, I suppose, in my library. But I got one absolutely free because you I was on the road. Twenty in your library? Oh yeah. You oh, can, we'll you don't, talk. You need a lot of Robinson Crusoe. Oh. But but I urge everyone who's um, who's listening today to to get a copy of Robinson Crusoe from their library, from a bookstore, or online and read it. It's it's magical. And when you get there, are two moments where you where you just light up. Uh, one of them is when he sees the footprint, and it is one of the one of the principal moments in Western literature. And the other is the seed moment where he realizes, I'm going to be just fine. If I can keep these seeds alive, I'm going to be just fine. I'm not going to be some mere savage hunter-gatherer. So I recommend this book very, very highly. And then you should watch Castaway, and you should read The Martian or see the film because they're both the same genre. Uh, it's a great book, great fun. Anyway, it is now time for this week's uh, Jefferson Watch, and thank you for a great conversation, sir. Over the past few days, I've had the wonderful, guilty pleasure of sitting down to read Robinson Crusoe cover to cover. I know I should have been doing other things, some of them pressing, but I just sat there and read this famous account of a man who was shipwrecked on a small island off Venezuela and spent 28 years there, most of them alone with a parrot and some semi-domesticated flocks of goats. When I took breaks, I wrote to a young friend who was about to go on a solo backpacking Jane Austen pilgrimage in England, think of that, wandering around southern England to sites associated with a 19th century novelist or her fictional characters. But hey, I once went on a last days of Mussolini pilgrimage in northern Italy, spending a whole day trying to find the exact spot where he was shot by the side of the road near Lake Como. And I have been remembering one of the supreme experiences of my life, reading Tolstoy's Anna Karenina for the first time cover to cover without taking any breaks, except to wolf down a steak and kidney pie or get a few hours of rest so that I could wake up and return immediately to my reading. The copy of Anna Karenina that I read straight through that magical summer, a thick Oxford classic paperback edition with a yellowish cover, is still with me after a dozen moves, It is a sacred relic in my world, maybe my most valuable book, though it cost only $8. One definition of a great book is that it is greatly new every time you read it. I suppose I have read Robinson Crusoe half a dozen times in the course of my life. As a novel, a sustained work of fiction that begins on page 1 and ends on page 310, Robinson Crusoe has some problems including lots of prefatory material. Can we just get him marooned on the island already? And a comparatively weak ending. But once Crusoe drags his half-drowned body onto the shore of the deserted island, coughing up seawater, the book is spectacular for 150 or 200 pages. Certain other works that have crept down into the human consciousness, Huckleberry Finn, Frankenstein, Dracula, Gulliver's Travels, Don Quixote, Moby Dick, have as novels certain structural weaknesses, and almost everyone agrees that the best parts of those novels are embedded in material that is sometimes confusing and sometimes disappointing. You just have to persevere 
you cannot let yourself get tripped up. What principally interests me as a Jeffersonian is how Crusoe uses the things he has salvaged from the wreckage of the ship to construct a new life. The novel is, in a sense, the story of economic man, excuse the sexist term, who works his way up Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. First, basic material needs, food, water, shelter, and a place to rest. Second, safety and security. Third, relationships with others. Fourth, prestige or a feeling of accomplishment. And fifth, self-actualization. If this were English 207 or Psychology 141, a student could cull the novel for evidence of each of these Maslowian stages in Crusoe's island life. Defoe takes it pretty far down the industrial path. Before too long, Crusoe has become a farmer and a rancher, a stock breeder, a tailor and a carpenter, a baker, a ceramicist, a charcoal manufacturer, and he is just about to master the art of beer making when he finds literature's most famous footprint on the beach, and the tone and trajectory of the novel change abruptly. By the middle of the book, Crusoe is calling himself the king and sovereign of the island, he has produced so much surplus food that he would establish an import-export business if only he could find a shipping firm that would pay a port of call now and then. All of this is utterly fascinating, especially Crusoe's early attempts to make furniture without proper tools or baskets or waterproof ceramic pots. At some point, Crusoe, getting pretty high on the Maslowian scale of accomplishment and self-actualization, actually declares that there is no handcraft that he could not master over time if he set himself to the challenge. When I read that, I looked up from the book and gazed into the distance out of my window and asked, is this true of me? Can I learn to be a carpenter, a welder, an auto mechanic, a ceramicist, a canoe maker, given enough time? Daniel Defoe's answer seems to be yes. This is what humans are. This is what humans do. This is what humans are capable of, thanks to their very clever brain and their opposable thumbs. You can see why all of that would appeal to Thomas Jefferson. I love literature that follows Theodore Roosevelt's advice to do what you can with what you have where you are. Use the tools you have. Crusoe, who is economic man on steroids, or at least on caffeine, turns the whole island into a small industrial park. By the time the indigenous refuge whom he names Friday shows up, Crusoe has a primary home and a seasonal getaway place, his own poplar forest, two grain farms, two pasturage farms, a fort, two boats, one of which he takes on cautious pleasure cruises. But then he was able to harvest a very large number of items from the wreckage of the ship, not the least of which were a small arsenal of guns and plenty of powder and lead. For the same reason, I enjoyed reading Andy Weir's The Martian, wherein the hero has to rework all sorts of systems to survive after being marooned on Mars. He too becomes a farmer, a potato farmer, using his own excrement as fertilizer. And I absolutely love Tom Hanks' Castaway, maybe the best modern adaptation of Robinson Crusoe. Three things about Castaway. First, never leave the Swiss Army knife behind. Second, Notice that the deflated soccer ball he paints and names Wilson serves his Maslowian need for relationships, just as Crusoe teaches a parrot to speak a number of sentences so they can have conversations. When Wilson is lost in a Pacific storm, Hank's character is so overcome with grief that he essentially gives up his quest for rescue. Third, at the end of Castaway, when Hanks realizes you can't go home again, he delivers a FedEx package he'd preserved all that time to its intended recipient, who turns out to be an absolutely beautiful, whimsical, slightly new-age artist, clearly single and unattached, who makes it clear that she would help to heal him. He's literally at a rural crossroads, and there she is, a gorgeous angel, who helps sustain him on the island because he vowed that if he ever got rescued, by golly, he was going to deliver that package. And though the film does not settle this question definitively, Hanks appears to drive on into an uncertain future. Whenever I see this, I want to reach right through the television screen and grab Hanks by the throat and say, Are you nuts? You drive away from her, from life, from Homer's Nausicaa, and you don't deserve happiness. But at least Castaway has a greater artistic integrity than Robinson Crusoe. Hanks is going to have reentry issues. You could say he has PTSD. So did Gulliver, who slept in a barn with horses for years after his return from his fourth and final voyage. 
But Crusoe simply returns to England, buys new clothes, and talks precisely like an Englishman, reclaims the considerable wealth he has all this time amassed in his Brazilian plantations, gets married, has three children, and unceremoniously resumes his life as a roving entrepreneur. The bewildered and disoriented Tom Hanks is closer to the truth. Think of the hero of Jack London's love of life, who after he is rescued, hoards as much food as he can pack into a ship's quarters. That's truth. When I finished Robinson Crusoe last night, I was sad to see it end. Time to reread Gulliver's Travels, which is a much different, and in many respects much greater book, maybe the greatest satire in the English language. And I have a hankering now to make another run at Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. I'm with my young friend on the Jane Austen Trail, in the tiny Maslovian list of things that redeem our lives and make us monstrously glad to be alive. Reading great books is right up there. Still, Tom Hanks, what the devil were you thinking? I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.